In the mid-1800s, Cincinnati was the largest city west of the Appalachian Mountains. Nestled on the banks of the mighty Ohio River, it was a major stop for steamboats. Yet transportation was changing rapidly, with rails replacing riverboats for transporting people and goods. This is the story of the Cincinnati Southern Railway. My name is Alfred Nippert. I've dealt in transportation law for decades, and the law firm of Nippert & Nippert has handled transportation matters since the era of Lusitania claims and narrow gauge railroads. The Cincinnati Southern was a purpose-built railroad to provide access to the South for Ohio goods, Cincinnati goods, and they had the Ferguson Act in order to do that. The Ferguson Act was placed in Ohio because the early part of the 18th 50s and 1840s, mass speculation had gone on and many cities had lost a lot of money. Mr. Ferguson of Cincinnati said there's got to be a better way. So he thought, why can't the city build it itself? Not a speculator involved, the city for the city. And that's indeed what caused the Cincinnati Southern to be built. I'm Kevin Flynn. I'm an attorney, retired city council person, former park board member lover of all things Cincinnati. Very, very interesting story about this, the, the uniqueness of the Cincinnati Southern Railway. Um, in Ohio, when, when they adopted the 1851 Constitution, to prevent abuses, they had prevented municipalities from investing in private companies. Before that, you wanted a railroad to come through your city, you invested in the railroad, and if you invested enough money, they'd come through your city. The legislature said, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. The problem with Cincinnati was, once rail came into play, Cincinnati had been the biggest city west of the Alleghenies in 1860 because of the river traffic and the amount of traffic and flow between the north and the south all came through Cincinnati. Once rail became developed, most of the rail lines went east and west. So there was a northern route that went through to Chicago and St. Louis, which helped those cities in the space of 10 years eclipse Cincinnati in size because they were rail hubs. In the south, you have east-west lines. They had a lot of raw goods, a lot of products that they needed to get to market. The northern people needed to get their products down to the south, but there really weren't north-south railroads. So Ferguson came up with the idea of to help grow Cincinnati, we'll build this railroad from Cincinnati to Chattanooga. It overcame obstacles that kept the U.S. military railroads from building it during the American Civil War. It overcame obstacles that had caused the collapse of the dream in 1837 and 1840, when the Bank of the United States Second Bank was not renewed by Andrew Jackson. From the construction of its iconic bridges and tunnels to the vital role it played in the transportation of goods and people. It overcame the obstacle of Louisville and Lexington Frankfurt controlled interests that had forced Cincinnati goods to get loaded on packet boats, taken to Louisville, offloaded, taken down the railroad line to Nashville and then dispersed. The obstacles that were overcome between 1830 and 1860 in other railroads, we learned how to build a railroad. At the time, Louisville had a monopoly on rail traffic going south with its rail line to Nashville. The LNN, built in 1850, was holding Cincinnati back. The effect was to make Cincinnati goods more expensive and slower to market. The construction process of the Cincinnati Southern Railroad was a remarkable engineering endeavor that necessarily relied on the tools and technology available at the time. The railway had to traverse challenging terrain, including steep mountains, deep valleys, and rugged wilderness. 
engineers and laborers faced formidable obstacles, requiring 105 bridges and 27 tunnels for the effort. There was even controversy about where to cross the Ohio River. Covington and Ludlow both wanted the bridge terminating in their cities. Ludlow won the battle when the Ludlow family gave away the land for a depot. Thomas D. Lovett was the principal engineer who oversaw the routing and construction of the railroad. Why, it took nearly two years just for the survey. Cross the New Ohio, then through the meandering hills of northern Kentucky. Then in southern Kentucky, we hit the Appalachian Mountains. Kings Mountain in particular was a bear. But finally, following the war, following the Ferguson Act, beginning in the 1870s, they started construction. The Irish families, black families from all over, came and worked on that railroad. And it became a link from Cincinnati to the southern markets. The route established, this was still an enormous project. Workers used axes, saws, and manual labor to clear the way. Horse-drawn plows and scrapers were used to grade the roadbed, ensuring it was level and stable. Workers had to excavate earth, build embankments, and cut through hills and mountains. The construction process created new technologies, like using a row of dynamite ignited at once to speed tunnel boring. Where the railroad needed to cross rivers, valleys, or low-lying areas, trestles and bridges were constructed. Because of the great weight of an engine car and the freight, these bridges had to be substantial. Tunnel construction was particularly challenging as it involved digging through solid rock. Workers used hand drills and sledgehammers to create holes for explosives. After blasting, workers used the rock for embankments and drainage. Teams of laborers worked together to carefully align the rails, secure them to the ties with spikes, and ensure the track was level and straight. Hand cars and horse-drawn carts were used to transport materials and equipment along the tracks during this process. As construction neared completion, depots sprang up and signal systems were installed, relying on the telegraph and signal men for communication. And once we got to Tennessee, them mountains just got bigger. The southern Kentucky, northern Tennessee part of the route was called the Rat Hole. Had more tunnels than the entire transcontinental railroad. All told, it was about five miles of underground. Folks would come out of them tunnels gasping and coughing from all the coal burning smoke that had nowhere to go. After years of tireless effort and significant investment, the Cincinnati Southern Railroad was completed in 1880. People from all over came to celebrate mayors from all of the different cities that, that the train tracks went through, the 338.2 miles of track. All of those mayors came up, the governor of Tennessee came up, they had a grand banquet that went on for ages. Completion of the Cincinnati Southern Railroad left an indelible mark on the city and the region. It cemented Cincinnati's status as a vital transportation hub. Here is Cincinnati. Down here is Chattanooga. Here is Atlanta. Atlanta was originally known as Terminus because that's where the railroads terminated and the water course, the Chattahoochee River, came up from the Gulf. Now, this had also been known as the Queen and Crescent Line. New Orleans is a Crescent City. Cincinnati is a Queen City. The Southern Railroad, which had been expanding following the war between the states, took an eye at this, and they decided it would be a good idea to acquire their interests and buy up the lease and the rest of the right-of-way. So you have a right-of-way from Cincinnati to New Orleans, one from Washington, D.C. through Atlanta, and on down to New Orleans. But the main stems, the spine line here, that is still in service and highly critical. While primarily built for freight, passenger service was part of the railroad's attractiveness. Especially with Pullman sleeper cars, making that run to New Orleans and back became far more palatable. The Chattanooga Choo Choo, a song popularized in the 1940s by the Glenn Miller Band and Andrew Sisters, brought added notoriety to the railway. 
Over the years, the types of cargo transported on the Cincinnati Southern Railroad diversified. Initially primarily focused on coal and minerals, the railroad began transporting a wide range of goods, including manufactured products, agricultural produce, and consumer goods. As we get into the 20th century, improvements started being, being made to railroads and larger you know, shipments had to be made. So our railroad track had to be changed to keep up with the times. Now the beauty of this was it was throwing off enough money from the lease payments to pay for these improvements. It's not the same railroad that was built back in 1870. They put double tracks in almost the entire length of the 338 miles. They've got depots in different places. They've got hundreds of miles of sidings and spurs and all of the things that go along with a railroad. As early as the 1890s, your railroad bigwig started talking about a combined terminal. Cincinnati was a hub and had seven different rail companies sprinkled throughout downtown. City and railroad leaders began to discuss a central hub to make operations and passenger transfers easier. And so it was that in 1929, construction began on the Union Terminal a defining piece of architecture with the largest half dome still in the Western world, flourished during the 1930s and even more during World War II with soldiers and war machines adding to the passenger traffic. The last of the great train stations, Union Terminal ended passenger service in 1971 as Americans fell in love with their cars. Passenger service was restored in 1992 with Amtrak and continues to this day. In 1972, the Cincinnati Southern Railroad was leased to the Norfolk Southern Corporation. And in fact, that's what the lease now calls for is they have to maintain and improve the road to keep it in the condition required by the federal government. The Surface Transportation Board has governance over the railroads. And so they've got all sorts of regulations about the tracks. And that is all on North of Southern dime. What is double stack container freight? Why is that important? Well, the railroad when built was built with 20, 30 tunnels in its middle division, known as the rat hole division. Because, and I remember as a child, coming from Asheville to visit family in Cincinnati, and we'd be in one tunnel and back in another, out, back in, out, back in. It was a rugged set of railroad. There's only one of those tunnels left. All of the others were daylighted, meaning completely eliminated because they cut the top of the mountain out all the way to the track. There's no tunnel anymore. Three others were reborn, and the line was straightened. This is significant because it made it have the clearance for container freight. And now it has clearance for the double stack. We've just spent billions rebuilding the Panama Canal. The new PanMax standard allows for 14,000 20 foot loaded containers. So, what does this mean to Cincinnati? We're talking about Panama. Why is this important to Cincinnati? And why are containers important? Because these containers are the way everything works. When you stop at a at a grade crossing, what's going by? Containers. Train after train of containers. Where do they come from? Mostly seaports. They either come from a seaport out on the west coast or Vancouver in, in British Columbia, or they come from the United States Gulf Coast and East Coast, primarily, that we see here. Those ports have all been upgraded. The past five years and with the projects presently on the books, there will have been a billion to two billion dollars invested in those ports. This is important. 14,000 20-foot containers, that equals 7,000 40-foot containers. You double that, so that's 3,500 railroad cars at a train average 
between 100 and 175 cars per train, you are now talking about 20 to 25 train loads of cars per ship, per ship coming through the Panama Canal. And that spine line that I've been talking about from Cincinnati to Chattanooga is critical because the ports along the Gulf Coast, they all funnel through Birmingham. The ports along the East Coast all funnel to Atlanta. And when they do that, they funnel to the spine line Everything that's going to be west of the Appalachians, west of the Alleghenies, needs to come this way. And that's the value of the railroad. The people of Cincinnati, they get all of the improvements that have been made as well. So it's not like Norfolk Southern can come in and rip out their, their track because they're mad. That belongs to the city when, when the lease terminates. That's that's a huge economic benefit. You know, the, the, the cost to try to reproduce this railway line would be just prohibitive in today's, in today's world. The Cincinnati Southern Railroad's value is clear and efforts have been made to preserve and document its legacy. Historical societies, museums, and rail enthusiasts have all worked to ensure that the history of this remarkable railroad is preserved for future generations. So what's the value to the city of this railroad? Is it just a rusty set of tracks that run off into the weeds? No, this is the spine line of what was the Southern, now the NS. It connects various lines of the NS together. Well, the Norfolk Southern doesn't want to give us their tonnage reports, doesn't want to tell us what they're making on this railroad. Why would they want to tell us what they're making? That might just say, hey, we need more money. So whatever we do, it should be at a fair value. And the present offering price is not a fair number. The presence of the railroad has prompted investments in transportation infrastructure, including roads, highways, and intermodal facilities. This has improved connectivity and made Cincinnati an attractive hub for logistics and distribution. The city is a passive owner of the real estate. The lease is what's known in the real estate world as an absolute net lease. All of the responsibilities for operation of the railroad are at the cost and the responsibility of the lessee, Norfolk Southern. So right now, as, as we speak, Norfolk Southern or its subsidiary leases the Cincinnati Southern Railway. God forbid that there's another East Palestine, Ohio, somewhere along our tracks. But from a potential liability standpoint, the lease puts all of that liability onto Norfolk Southern. And in fact, if the city incurred any expenses at all, Norfolk Southern would have to reimburse the city for those expenses that were incurred. It doesn't get much safer than that. As Cincinnati's most valuable asset, the Cincinnati Southern Railroad has been a linchpin in the economic, cultural, and historic fabric of Cincinnati. It has provided jobs, fueled economic growth, and connected the city to markets near and far. At this time, its future is in question. Now, if you're putting in fiber optics, you need this spine line to connect. If you're going to start flying packages with Amazon, they are looking at using the air rights over these rights of way to deliver packages. What better way? They've got a hub here in Cincinnati at Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Airport and put it over this spine line coming to Chattanooga. How better way to connect anything out of Cincinnati to Chattanooga and Chattanooga's high speed internet service to rural America, to rural America, to rural America? This is an asset not prone to losing money. Like property everywhere, it is not likely to lose value. And with new uses for the railway coming online, 
the prospects for the future value of this railway are bright indeed. It seems clear that selling the Cincinnati Southern Railroad could have far-reaching and negative consequences for the city and its residents. Even now, Cincinnati voters are making their choice on future ownership with issue 22 on the November 2023 ballot. It is our hope that this incredible asset, enabled by the citizens of Cincinnati generations ago, remains our city's asset for generations to come.